I'm Bill Modrum, and I'm head of Special Collections and University Archives. Here's my university, and I want to welcome those here and those online. As we celebrate Ohio Archives Month with today's presentation, Archiving Ohio's World War II History. First, I want to thank all those involved in this important presentation, especially Jackie Johnson, my university archivist, and Sean Vanessa, our communication specialist. Before I introduce our speaker, I want to read my university's land acknowledgement and our statement on racism. Miami University is located within the traditional homelands of the Miami and Shawnee people who, along with the other indigenous groups, ceded these lands to the United States in the first Treaty of Greenville in 1795. The Miami people, whose name our university carries, were forcefully removed from these homelands in 1846. In 1972, a relationship between Miami University and the Miami tribe of Oklahoma began and evolved into a reciprocal partnership including the creation of the Miami Center at Miami University in 2001. The work of the Miami Center serves the Miami tribe community and is dedicated to the revitalization of the Miami language and to restoring the knowledge to the Miami, Miami people. Miami University and the Miami tribe are proud of this work and the more than 140 Miami students who have attended Miami University since 1991 through the Miami Heritage Award program. Miami University Libraries Statement on Racism. The libraries are a welcoming, inclusive, and safe resource for, the, for every person in our community. We believe that Black Lives Matter, racism, violence, discrimination, oppression, and hatred are antithetical to our values, mission, and fundamental humanity. And we will not be tolerated in any violence affiliated spaces or services. We, are the, we the libraries must continue to listen, learn, and better understand injustice and the experiences of others in order to truly be a welcoming and inclusive resource for all. We are, we are dedicated to doing the work necessary to better to be better allies of and advocates for the victims of injustice. Now it's my honor to introduce our speaker. Brad Spurlock is the manager of the Smith Library of Regional History and the, and the Cummins Local History Room for Lane Libraries. He's worked with local history collections at, in the Lane Libraries for over 10 years now. He has a BA in history from Xavier University and an MLIS from Kent State University. He is a certified archivist through the Academy of Certified Archivists. And in his spare time, he enjoys reading history, watching baseball, and spending time with his wife and his four-year-old twins. Uh, I, please join me in welcoming Brad, and we'll take questions at the end. And you can ask him about his twins. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much for that kind of introduction. Um, so today we're going to be talking about um, the role of archives in preserving World War II history, um, specifically for the Oxford area, but also just in general. Um, so not only is it important um, to record the information on the wartime community of Oxford, but also the servicemen and women um, who came from Oxford um, and then also lived in Oxford after the conflict. Um, so libraries, archives, and museums um, are the holders of cultural heritage. Um, it's their job to not only <clears throat> um, ensure the significance of the broad trends of the past are preserved from an academic angle, but also um, to record for a new generation the struggles of feeding your family with ration stamps um, and from food from your victory garden. Um, the struggle of seeing friends and family leave for unknown war zones, reading weekly reports in the Oxford Press um, about the progress of the war and the most recent casualties, um, or life in the Betts village after you return from the war. Um, the archive um, in general, and in a specific sense, Smith Library of Regional History and also Patrick Hearst Special Collections, um, is the holder of the memory of these things, not only for individuals and their families, but also for the general community of Oxford and Miami University. Speaking about veterans, um, at the present rate, um, according to the National World War II Museum in New Orleans, 
Um, 180 World War II veterans are dying each day. Um, there are about 167,000 of the 16 million that served still alive, which equals about 1%. Uh, in the state of Ohio, there's under 7,000. Um, so if you uh, divide that by the ADA counties, that means there's approximately 80 in Butler County who are still alive on average. Um, so it's very important um, that their stories are not forgotten. And throughout this presentation, I'm going to speak in about ways um, that we try to make sure that their struggles are not forgotten. Not only is it important to remember the veterans, but it's also important to remember the lives that were lost in World War II from the local area. Um, and that would be people such as these three individuals, um, Edson Lawrence Williams, uh, Private Charles Warren Jr., and Second Lieutenant Richard Kirsting, um, who were all killed in action or died in service um, during World War II and were all from the Oxford area. It is the job of archives including the Smith Library, uh, to collect, preserve, and disseminate what we can um, in order to ensure permanent local retention of this information. So we don't want to just leave uh, it up to national repositories and you know government agencies and things like that um, to, to recall the service of these individuals and the sacrifice of, the, of these individuals, but we also want to make sure that their memory stays in the community that they lived in. So to start with, I'm going to talk about collecting. So collect, preserve, and disseminate. Um, this is the first step in that process. Uh, collecting is not just collecting materials. It's also about collecting information. So really, the information that's within those materials is the real commodity. It's not the materials themselves. Um, it's important for uh, archives and libraries and museums um, to comprehend that and to realize that when they're going to session and, and things like that um, to look at the informational value. Now that being said, um, the materials themselves can serve um, as artifacts of the past and have inherent value in that in that regard. So that would be something you know like a, a, a ratchet stamp book that survives. That has very little informational value unless you're somehow related to the person the book was issued to or something like that, but it has inherent value as an artifact of the time period. Sorry. Um, so one way that we go about collecting is through donations. Um, this is an example of a donation that, that came to Smith Library. Um, Philip Shira, Shira <coughs> excuse me, um, he was killed in action. He was part of the Merchant Marine, um, and I'll talk a little bit about him at the end and when I talk about the service of some of the veterans from the local area. Um, but his family donated to Smith Library a scrapbook that was kept by his widow, um, and this is one page from that scrapbook. And not only does it consist of photographs and newspaper clippings, but it also has handwritten notes on the pages um, that correspond to that. Um, so like in this example, um, his widow wrote that that was the last picture taken of them together and that it wasn't a really good picture because it was developed from an unproved negative or something like that. Um, another way that we go about collecting information is through community history projects. Um, this can include oral histories. Um, prior to when I worked at Smith Library, Smith Library did several oral history projects with World War II veterans, um, several of which were from Oxford's Black community, which makes them all the more important to record. Um, this is an example of one that was done with Arthur Miller. Um, his interview is, is really fascinating, um, and it gives a perspective that you wouldn't think about normally when you're thinking about World War II history. I would uh, highly encourage everybody to visit our website and listen to some of these oral histories uh, that, are, that are there. Um, there is vast potential for future um, community history projects of various sorts. Um, we haven't done a lot specifically on World War II, 
uh, besides that one, but we are planning to do them. Um, I actually have, or I'm in the process of setting up an oral history with a 100 year old uh, Navy veteran from the area um, to do an oral history. So that should hopefully go well. Digitization is another way that we collect information. So we have these, most of the time, we have these resources in our collections already. But by digitizing them, putting them into a format that makes it more accessible and more searchable, then that allows for us to harvest information from these sources to a greater degree than it once could. We currently have the Oxford Press out for digitization. Um, Smith Library does. When that comes back, we will hopefully be able to integrate that into some kind of system that will allow us to search the contents. Um, and that will unlock information that previously is not known. Um, it was previously kept on microfilm. Um, you can, there's a certain point where you're no longer getting information on microfilm because it's, it's based on the humor. You have to sit there and read everything and look through it and you get to keep that for a while. Uh, but when you can let a computer do that work and search for it, it's more apt to give you um, information that you hadn't previously found. We also can do this through our databases. Um, most of these are databases we subscribe to or um, free databases online that we often suggest people visit. Um, Ancestry and Family Search kind of work the same way. They have a plethora of genealogy type records on them. Um, not only do they have military records, but they also have, or you can also use them to just find biographical information on veterans, you know, birth, death, marriage, things like that. Um, Fold three. Uh, is exclusively military records. Um, that one takes a little bit more work. Um, I think the search engine isn't quite as good as what Ancestry would be for that. Um, you kind of have to know what you're looking at, but there is a ton of information on there if you do about World War II. Um, they put sometimes things like boarding reports were filled out by company clerks each day. Um, they have things on there like after action reports to talk about engagements the units were in. Um, ship rosters, unit histories, all kinds of things like that. Um, and that can provide a great deal of information on, on the little people. Um, and then Internet Archive is one of many platforms that is uh, creating a digital library of books. Um, and then you also can use government databases um, such as the AAE from NARA. Um, there's World War II information on there on prisoners of war in one of the databases. Um, and, and several things like that. The Lane Public Library um, has both um, the Smith Library of Regional History and the Covenant Civil History Room, two different repositories. Um, we utilize both of those in doing research most of the time. Um, there are some resources at one that are not at the other and vice versa, and that's just to show that collaboration is a very important element in doing research on World War II history and community history projects related to World War II. Um, an example of that uh, would be the Butler County Soldiers, Sailors, and Pioneers Monument, um, which is currently administered by the Butler County Historical Society. Um, they are compiling lists of veterans from the, from the entire Butler, all of Butler County. Um, we have contributed information to them to help um, generate those lists um, from our archive archival holdings and, and things like that. Um, in return, we've gone there and have access to their materials for various projects and things like that. Collaboration is an essential element to running any archive or doing any project within an archive. There are several other places that are outside of our archives where information on World War II is held and can be um, extremely useful for projects and research. Um, some of these, can be veterans websites or unit history websites, um, social media. Uh, for example, I have contacted before um, on social media some of the, the people that served with my grandfather in World War II. Um, you can generate information from that. You know, maybe they remember you know, they served in the same unit, so they had similar experiences. So perhaps you have heard a story from your descendant and they've heard one from theirs. You can compare them, you can add information. Um, and then especially 
and you take those oral history stories that have been passed down through families and compare them to other resources found, um, that's when you can really start getting some good history together. It's just another example of some of those. Um, when I talk about also national repositories, so I already talked about their database AAD, um, but also government entities such as the National Archives and Records Administration uh, and the National Personnel Records Center, um, they hold a ton of information. The problem is access with those usually. Um, so a lot of that information on World War II is not, has not been digitized or added to any database. Um, so you either have to go and visit a person or get an independent researcher to check that information for you. Uh, but they have all kinds of things there. So if anybody's ever wanting to do personal genealogy research on World War II veteran, um, that would be an option also. And then another thing to think about is bias. Um, bias is inherently um, in the way of research um, and archiving. When you're recording information about an era and a, a large event such as World War II, it's very important to record as many varying perspectives as you possibly can. Um, and that is kind of goes to what I was speaking about with um, some of the oral histories we did of Black veterans, um, but also um, things like this, like how many people knew that there was a WAVES and a SPARS unit that was in Oxford during World War II. The WAVES was the uh, women's branch of the Navy, the SPARS was the women's branch of the Coast Guard. Um, a lot of them came here and went to the radio school that was in operation, but also. There's academic bias that comes into play here uh, with archives. A lot of archives are very territorial about the scope of their collections um, and have a, a geographic bias. So um, things like this can happen where this is a unit history that was published on the 4th Marine Division in World War II. This is not related at all to Southwestern Ohio in any way but um, it holds a lot of information. Um, and it's, it's pictures of people who served there, pictures of places that they served overseas, things like that. But because it doesn't fall in the geographic scope, some archives may not accession this. That puts materials like this at risk because um, the military does, isn't tied to a single geographic location. Um, so sometimes it can be difficult for archives to stop in geographically um, or, you know, to, to release themselves from their own academic bias. Um, and it's important that that happens so that things like this are preserved permanently, which takes us to preservation. Record loss events are some of the biggest threats to us in the archival industry. Um, this was a major one that greatly affected um, the future study of World War II, and that was the 1973 uh, National Records Personnel Center fire in St. Louis. Uh, this destroyed 80 percent of Army records from 1912 to 1960, which includes the Air Force, because the Air Force is part of the Army of World War II. My grandfather's records were destroyed in this fire, um, as were a large number of patrons that I've helped at the library. Um, oftentimes, we put together a packet of information for them um, based on everything we could find, and then we give them a referral to the, to the National Records or National Personnel Records Center. Um, and then they get a note back saying that it's no longer in existence because of the fire. Um, we do that with physical archiving. Um, so basically, we hold an archive at Smith Library mostly. There's a few records that are at the Commons Group, but not nearly was at the Smith Library as far as the archives and manuscript collections go. And we collect as much as we can on World War II um, and the veterans and the casualties from the area that served. And we house all them in archival appropriate enclosures, um, acid free, et cetera. Um, and I'll just show you some of the materials that we have that are related to World War II. We have a vast collection not fast. We have a large collection of posters from the World War II era that have been preserved, such as these. We do have primary source documents. This is one of the ration books I've mentioned a couple times so far. 
Um, there's materials um, on both the flight training and the radio school that were held at Miami University in our in our archive. And then other primary sources, and we have special collections, which are books. Um, all of these books tie back to Butler County, Southwestern Ohio, Ohio, and Oxford history in some way. Um, either they're written by veterans that were from the area, um, or they have mentions of veterans from the area in them. And this is just a sampling of what we have. Um, we also have photograph collections. Um, these are both from the Gilson Wright photograph collection that's held by Smith Library. Um, he extensively photographed um, the, the naval operations in Oxford during World War II, um, various aspects of them, this big folder full of those, uh, as well as some negatives that haven't been developed. Um, some of these photos have been actually been scanned from those negatives to positive. We also have, as I mentioned before, the microfilm collection um, of the Oxford Press. This is an example of Oxford Press is listing um, all the men and women from Oxford that served. And we also have independent collections um, that cover World War II, such as the Jim Blount Manuscript Group, the Bob White Manuscript Group, and then the Dunn Unifia Smith Manuscript Group, which was the original collection of Smith Library when it was created. Um, whoops. So uh, we also, as I mentioned, we do all of our archival work, um, preservation work, and things like that with all of those to make sure that they don't deteriorate over time. Um, so, in disseminate is the last point. Um, and basically, um, the way I see it, if you aren't going to use it, there's no point in keeping it. Um, if you have something in your archive, it needs to be available and to be used. Um, there's no value to something that's just sitting on a shelf permanently and never being looked at. Beyond that, um, collecting pieces and tidbits and things like that is what we end up doing. But that doesn't show the entire um, history of World War II in the area. That requires an analysis of the past or you know, history. One of the ways that we do that is the, through the avail availability of resources. Um, so we are currently building a digital history repository. Um, this is the staff side of one of the World War II sections, um, just to show you um, where we are. Each of these individuals on here we have collected information on for whatever reason, um, but instead of just you know answering a patr patron's request, putting together a packet of information and giving it to them, we retain a copy of that and organize it um, into the World War II area so that we have all of that permanently on file. A lot of that is also available on our website, the public side. Um, that will greatly expand in the near future. Um, at the present moment, with what we're doing, we're basically building the back end. Um, then once we get that to a certain point, then we'll um, start transitioning a lot of that over to the public sites. So it's integrated with our library catalog. Um, and then it's available just for people browsing on our website instead of having to contact us to, to find it and supply it to them. As I've mentioned a couple of times, we also do reference research or reference requests for patrons. Um, this is an example of what we might put together for a patron. Um, it's just a collection of pretty much any kind of document um, or information source that contains information on that individual service. Um, and then collectively, that preserves information on the community as a whole because the community is made up of people. So if you collect information on the people, you collect also collected information on the community by extension. Um, another way that we do that is for publication. Um, Oxford and Miami University during World War II uh, is a 1994 publication by Bob White uh, that was a publication of the Smith Library of Region History. Um, we do occasionally publish books uh, and this is one of ours that we have. And we do actually have this available for purchase at the Smith Library if anybody's interested. And in other ways for programming, um, these are the three programs that I've done on, on World War II history um, recently in the last few years. Um, a lot of times these are in commemoration of certain events. So like the Butler County of Normandy was for the 75th anniversary of D-Day. Um, Oxford on the battlefront um, was done uh, for the 80th anniversary of the Pearl Harbor attack. 
Um, and then we do offer genealogy programming. So we built a World War II genealogy program before, um, as well as just general military uh, genealogy programs. We do those relatively uh, regularly. Okay, and now um, thinking about disseminating information, I'm just going to talk to you about some of the veterans that were from Butler County or from Oxford specifically um, that we have collected information on. So the first is Ensign Lawrence A. Williams Jr., United States Navy. Um, he was born in Oxford Township on a farm on June 3rd, 1914. Uh, by 1930, him and his family had moved to the village of Oxford. He was part of the uh, graduating class from Miami of 1936. Uh, he briefly moved to Canton, Ohio, um, where he worked with his sister and brother-in-law at a lumber company. And he enlisted in the Navy in May of 1940. Um, he was actually able to go to pilot school um, and became a naval aviator in May of 1941, was assigned to the Pacific Fleet. Um, he was stationed on the USS Arizona, uh, and he was actually a so the, the battleships at the time had observation planes. They were float planes that they could launch and pick up with a crane from the sea. He flew one of those, it was called a Kingfisher. Um, and he was on board the USS Arizona on December 7th uh, during the Japanese attack. And he was killed in the blast um, that also sank the USS Arizona. Um, a lot of times he's considered the first um, Butler County death in World War II. Um, there were actually seven uh, people from Butler County that were killed at the Pearl Harbor attack. He was just one of them. Um, but based on the fact that he was on the Arizona, he very well possibly could have been um, one of the very first from Butler County. The next one I'm going to speak about is uh, third assistant engineer, Philip Carter of Shira um, Sr. He was actually part of the Merchant Marine, uh, which was considered part of the Armed Forces of World War II. He was a native of Oxford and did attend Miami University. Um, he married Sarah Matthews, um, and they moved to Columbus um, right before he uh, well, went overseas for the first time. Um, he actually had worked as a Merchant Marine for several years prior to World War II. Um, and on May 5th of 1942, he was part of the crew of the SS Java Arrow, um, which was an oiler. Um, this is part of what would later be referred to as the Battle of the Atlantic. The United States was shipping war materials and supplies overseas to fight against um, the Germans primarily uh, before we were actually involved in the war. Um, this would have been after war had been declared against uh, between the United States and Germany also at this point. Um, he was eight miles off the coast of Vero Beach, Florida, in a convoy, um, and his ship fell behind the rest of the convoy. Um, and a German U-boat or a submarine, U-333, um, took sight of the Java Arrow and fired a torpedo at it. Uh, the torpedo impacted and greatly damaged the Java Arrow. Um, and Philip Shira was in the was stationed in the engine room when this happened um, he immediately recognized the ship was going too fast to deploy lifeboats um, so he turned off the engines um, which also uh, kept the boilers from overheating and exploding um, and that allowed for all of his shipmates to, to uh, get off the ship and onto lifeboats before a second torpedo impacted and uh, trapped him in the engine room, he would die in service. Um, however, he received the Merchant Marine Distinguished Service Medal, uh, which is the Merchant Marine equivalent of the Medal of Honor um, for his actions on that day. Captain Kenneth Glass, he actually didn't come to our area until after World War II. Um, he was born on February the 22nd, 1922, in Dundee, Iowa. Um, he grew up on a farm. Um, he joined the Navy and went, went through to also become a naval aviator, um, except he piloted a Grumman TBF Avenger torpedo bomber, which was a three-seat um, 
it's a smaller bomber aircraft. It's deployed off of aircraft carriers. Um, he was stationed on the USS Hornet um, and saw extensive service in the Pacific in World War II. Uh, they supported the invasion of Western New Guinea. Um, they did air raids on the Caroline Islands. Um, in June of 1944, they raided Saipan, Tinian, Iwo Jima, Chichima, and Rota. Um, and then he was also part of one of the largest naval battles in the sea, I believe, uh, Battle of the Philippine Sea in June of 1944. Um, and he was part of an element that uh, badly damaged a Japanese aircraft carrier as part of that battle. Um, his ship was actually uh, involved in a typhoon and greatly damaged and had to return to port. Um, and he was actually in the United States when the war ended. Um, he married and moved to Michigan for a little while, and then he moved to Oxford and was a uh, professor at Miami University um, in the education department for many, many years. Um, and he died in 2017. First Lieutenant Thomas, Thomas K. McDill. Um, he was born in 1921 in Oxford, went to McGuffey High School, and then on to Miami. Um, he joined uh, the United States Army Air Force. As I said, the Air Force is part of the Army in World War II. Um, in 1943, um, and he was sent to England, um, where he was involved with a strategic bombing campaign against Germany. Um, it was a campaign that was targeting Germany's ability to make war its industry. This was an extremely deadly assignment, um, and in many cases, the lifespan of air crews was measured in days at that point in the war. He flew a North American P-51B Mustang fighter plane. Um, it was called Little Mac, and he ended up doing 16 missions, uh, mostly escorting Germans, or I'm sorry, escorting bombers over Germany. Um, he was involved in several dogfights and actually ended up with three kills to his credit, um, a German aircraft. Um, but on a mission over uh, Czechoslovakia, uh, they were returning through Germany. He was actually shot down by a German, air, or German aircraft um, and had to bail out. Um, he was captured um, by German civilians who spit at him and threw things at him and threatened him. Um, and he was luckily taken to the Luftwaffe, which was the German Air Force. Um, German Air Force camps were a lot more friendly than a lot of other uh, German camps during World War II because there was a large number of German airmen that were in allied camps. Um, so as a unspoken reciprocal agreement, um, they treated their airmen um, a lot better than they did other prisoners of war. Um, and he was basically in the camp until he was liberated seven months later. Um, he served in the National Air National Guard during the Korean War. Um, and then he was actually an investigator for the NTSB for 25 years after that. Um, and he died in 1998. I have his name incorrect on that slide. It's Chester Warren Jr. Um, he was born in Oxford in 1924. Um, he graduated from Stewart High School. Um, as a significant number of other members of Oxford's Black community did, he worked as a janitor for Miami University prior to entering the service. Um, he was drafted in 1942, and at this point in time, the U.S. military was still segregated. Um, he was sent to an all-black unit, the 100, or sorry, 1,993rd Quartermaster Truck Company, um, a significant contribution um, from African Americans to World War II was driving trucks and supplies back and forth. It's often not uh, recognized, it should be. Because uh, it was a vital role. Without them, the food and ammunition wouldn't reach the front. Uh, he was actually sent um, via the Mediterranean Sea and Suez Canal um, to the China Burma India Theater, uh, which is another um, often overlooked uh, theater of combat in World War II. Um, and that was basically a supply port. Um, so in that theater, the Allies were attempting to move supplies to the Chinese Nationalist Army that was fighting against the Japanese. And most of the operations that took place in that theater were based on that. Um, he drove uh, trucks 
in the region of the Himalayan mountains, either in India or Burma, probably crossed between those two countries multiple times. Um, and then while supporting a buildup of forces uh, near Mayakina, Burma, um, he was actually involved in an aircraft accident. And there's conflicting sources about what, what exactly happened. Um, but either way, he was evacuated to India and he died um, at the hospital in India a few days later on October 14th, 1944. Um, so he is not listed as killed in action. He's actually listed as DNB or died non -battle. Um, And that was the case for a large number of veterans um, who lost their lives in World War II, that, that they, they died in service but were not necessarily killed by the enemy. And then lastly, we'll talk about Second Lieutenant Richard Kirsten. Um, he was born in Ottawa, Ohio, but lived in Oxford for the majority of his life. Um, he was very well educated. He went to McGuffey, Ohio State University, Miami, and Dartmouth. Um, probably because of his um, education, he uh, joined the Engineer Corps of the U.S. Army. Um, before entering the service, um, he actually worked in the defense industry um, for both Armco Steel and Middletown, and also at the Wright Aeronautical Corporation of Lachlan, um, both very, very major employers at the time of the Butler County. He was sent to England, and he actually came ashore at Omaha Beach on D plus three, so three days after D Day, he landed on Omaha Beach. Um, as an engineer um, and as an engineer officer, um, he was in charge of construction projects um, and toward the front lines, not far behind the infantry. Um, they did a lot of things like building Bailey bridges, clearing minefields, um, that kind of thing. Um, and as they continued to push out of Normandy and into the Bocage or the, the French countryside that was covered with hedgerows, um, he was engaged in heavy fighting there. There was a major town in Normandy called St. Lo. There was a major battle that occurred at that town. Um, while there, um, him and his unit um, basically became engaged in a firefight with a large German group. Um, he pretty much single-handedly captured 40 uh, German prisoners of war. Um, and for that, uh, he was awarded the Distinguished Service Cross but unfortunately, two days later, or two weeks later, he was shot in the back and killed in action. Um, and that concludes my program. Um, I'd be more than happy to take any questions you might have at this point. Yes. Uh, having been personally acquainted with Jim Blunt and Tom Standard, mm -hmm. both of whom have since passed on, two local historians that I would rely on out of my laziness to get information without actually researching it myself. Um, I know they were involved, you mentioned uh, with with your uh, services there. Mm -hmm. uh, how many local historians, I don't mean people that check in from California, Michigan, wherever, uh, do you, you think you guys deal with uh, semi-regularly? So the question was how many historians, local historians do we regularly deal with? Um, I would say, a pretty good number. Um, and in addition to that, the some of the people that you mentioned, Tom Stanger and Jim Blatt, we have their collections at Smith Library. Um, so we still deal with them a lot. We use their records a lot. Um, we go through them um, and archive them, do the preservation work and all that with them. Um, as far as a number, it's, it'd be hard to give a number. If I was going to guess, I'd say maybe 20 or so regular recurring um, patrons that we deal with. Um, a lot of them have a specific focus, so, um, you know, so like, we're also the home of the Southwestern Ohio Bluegrass Peace and Heritage Archive. We have um, a certain set of people that are contacting us constantly for material from there, or, or contributing material to there, so um, things like that. I yes. do want to ask Brad, and I, it's probably been asked before, but you know, we're talking Oxford, the middle of the Midwest. Mm -hmm. I know there was an NROTC program, but the waves, you have Naval and Coast Guard in the middle of the Midwest. Yep. Where, I mean, where did they train? Oh, at Miami. Um, I mean, water-wise. Or, oh, yeah. yeah we, um, um, well, most of those, 
that they were only here to learn the specific tax game um, of working the radios and then also of you know the white school that was here uh, and things like that. So most of the naval ports at that point in time, I would say, were probably busy with military operations, um, especially because of the vast number of troops we were sending overseas. Um, so they were probably looking for places where they could train people. And I would say that most universities at the time probably had some kind of military training program with at least one of the branches. There were also Marines here, too, at the same time. Yes. You met you you showed three publications up on the screen uh from various, I think they were local authors. And, and in the event, the uh I'm sure those are available for review, probably non-circulatory uh there. But do you have any of the publications that you guys have dealt with that are available for purchase? Um so the question was if we have any of the publications um on World War II available for purchase. Um we do have um, Bob White's book available for purchase on World War II. Um, as far as World War II specifically goes, that's the only one. Mm -hmm. um, but for getting World War II, for the oh yeah, we have we have several books that are available for for, for purchase from the local area. That's correct. Yeah. Okay. The latest one, um, and we're actually doing a program on this soon, is Homes of the Logsford. Um, it was put together by Valerie Elliott, um, and that um, covers the history of several homes. From the area so that's been the most popular one and the best seller recently what about little chicago i know blount did a lot of stuff on little chicago he did yes so that's actually going to be a program series that i hold um and we have in developing that we use jim blount's materials extensively and are those available for publication i mean a purchase so, um i don't think we have any copies of little chicago left but we do have several copies of jim blount's materials um the for sale Smith Library. I also know that the Butler County Historical Society has reprinted most of his books and has those for sale. Okay. So yeah, I remember I, I bought advertising on the back of at least one of those covers because I enjoyed the work. Don't have them anymore, but uh, yeah, that's your best bet is Butler County Historical Society. Thank you. Uh huh. Okay. Well, thank you very much for having me.